Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a bunco fugitive detail. A pawnbroker tells you he suspects a swindle. He isn't sure. Your job? Check it out. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, May 18th. It was cool in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Bunko Fugitive Detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Dillion. My name's Friday. I was on my way into the office, and it was 7.55 a.m. when I got to room 38. Bunko Fugitive. Fred. Never know. Hi, Joe. Morning. You remember Fred Alpin? Oh, sure. Hi, Fred. Hi. Hold my own, Sergeant. Well, what's new? I'm not sure. Maybe just wasting my time. Yours, too. Fred thinks he's stumbled onto a con game, Joe. All right. No, look that way to me, anyhow. Yeah. No. Well, what's the sting? Well, I was just telling Smith here. Yeah. A fella came in last night, a little guy. He was kind of timid. Probably never been to a pawn shop before. At least he wasn't a steady. You know, I can spot them straight off. Yeah. Wanted to pawn a ring. Got a big green stone. Fancy setting. All gimmicked up, you know. Mm-hmm. Man's ring. Real fancy, though. Asked me what it was worth. What would you tell him? Worth 20 bucks, maybe 25. Is that what you told him? Ah, you know I can't loan full value. You know that. Mm-hmm. I offered him five bucks. I would have gone up to ten if he'd have pressed me. That's better than a lot of brokers would give. Did he take the five? Are you kidding? He went all the pieces. Thought he was going to have a hemorrhage. Started calling me a crook. Said the ring was an emerald. Shouted, screamed all over the place. It's an emerald, he said. A $5,000 emerald. That hunk of glass. Are well, you sure you didn't make a mistake, Fred? No, I ask you, Sergeant. Would anybody try to pawn a 5G emerald with me, I ask you? Uh-huh. Glass, that's what it was. Green glass. A nice setting, though. What do you think, Joe? Well, the old diamond switch, maybe. Could be. Sounds like the only difference is the color. You get his name, Fred? Yeah, I asked him. He just shouted and carried on, though. He wasn't making any sense at all. Got his license, though. Oh? Yeah, he was parked right in front of the place. Got the number when he drove off. Thought you might want it. Mm-hmm. I wrote it out. Put it in my pocket. It should be right here. Now, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, here it is. A match folder on the inside. Uh, you make it out all right? Yeah, I think so. We'll check it. Uh-huh. Might be a good idea if you got right on it, huh? What do you mean? Well, just before he left my place, he stopped all that carrying on. I think it sunk in what I told him about the ring being no good. Yeah. Got real quiet, you know, kind of like he was making up his mind about something. Yeah. Asked me to sell him a gun. Fred Alpin gave us a description of the man who had tried to pawn the ring. We called our branch of DMV and asked them to check the license number. They came up with the information that the automobile bearing that license was registered in the name of Garfield Hunt at 221 North Selma Avenue, Hollywood. 9.03 a.m. Frank and I drove out to talk to him. Boy, well, sure is a clear day. Look at those hills, Joe. Well, I read in the paper you can see for 40 miles. Yeah, I bet. Good morning. Who are you? What do you want? Is Mr. Hunt here? No. No, he's not here. Well, he lives here, doesn't he? Who are you? Well, I'm sorry, ma'am. We're police officers. Police? That's right. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Where is he? What's happening to him? Mind if we come inside? It'd be a little easier to talk. Oh, yes, of course. Oh, I forgot. Sofa's still made up. Slept down here last night, so I'd be near the phone. I thought he might call. Thought somebody'd call. Your husband didn't come home. Never happened before. Not in 37 years. Yes, ma'am. Just let me fold up that blanket so you Here, can I'll sit give down. You a hand, oh, thank you. You got any idea where your husband might have gone, Miss Hunt? No. No idea at all. What time did he leave? Nine thirty five. Looked at the clock as he went out the door. Couldn't believe it. Not like God to go out that late. We're usually in bed by ten. Yes, ma'am. He promised me he'd only be gone an hour. Promised me he'd be back by ten thirty for sure. I see. Never heard a word from him after that. Not a word. What do you suppose happened to him? Well, we're sorry we don't know, Miss Hunt. Well, you must have some notion. Sorry we don't. You said you wanted to talk to him. 
Just a few questions, routine. What about? Oh, we'd rather talk to him. You notify the police that he's missing? No, I didn't know what to do. Figured you'd get in touch with me when you found him. Guess I wasn't thinking very good. Never happened before. Yes, ma'am. Are there any friends he might be staying with, relatives? We don't know anybody else from Los Angeles. I see. Just moved out here last winter from Kansas. Children have grown up, settled. Gar sold the business. We moved out here. Kansas winters can be pretty cold. Yes, ma'am. Is your husband retired? Well, he should be. He worked hard all his life. He deserves a rest. Had a little trouble with his heart last year. No, not a real attack. But the doctor told him to take it easy. Mm-hmm. Not Gar, though. Wasn't out here two months before he got all restless and fidgety. Just couldn't take it sitting around the house. Started up again. In business? Yes, sir. We had a tailor shop back in Kansas. Gar found a new business district opening up in the San Fernando Valley. Off of Magnolia Boulevard. They were renting cheap. You know, right at the beginning. Wanted tenants. Mm-hmm. And didn't do much business at first, but things have been getting better. Well, Gar's a good tailor. A lot more careful than most. Learned his trade young. The days when and there were tailors. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you try to reach him there at the shop? I called last night three, four times. This morning, too. Nobody answered. Let's see. You think you can, you can find him? We'll do our best. I guess maybe I should have notified you last night. Yes, ma'am. I didn't know what to do. Thought you'd get in touch with me if something happened. Well, better to call us first. Yeah, I guess so. Then it might not happen. Mrs. Hunt gave us a description of her husband. We advised her to make a formal report at the Valley Division. A local and an APB were sent out. 3.15 p.m. Patrol car unit 9L78 reported Hunt had been found sitting in his car. The car was parked on Mulholland Drive. Hunt had readily identified himself. We asked the officers to bring him in for questioning. Hi, Joe. Frank. Pete. Hi, Pete. Here he is. Thanks for spotting him for us. Sure, anytime. Want to sit down, Hunt? Go ahead, sit down. Uh, what do you want with me? Just like to talk to you, that's all. This is Frank Smith. My name's Friday. I've never been under arrest before, not once. Well, now you're not under arrest now, Mr. Hunt. Then what am I doing here? Why did those officers make me come with them? Well, you didn't go home last night. Your wife's been worried about you. Well, I was going home when they found me. Wasn't any place else to go. Sarah oughtn't to have called. She didn't call, sir. Well, how'd you find out? You tried to buy a gun. A pawn shop over on Main Street. Oh, what would you want the gun for? I wouldn't have hurt him. I just wanted my money back. I thought I could scare him. That's all. I don't know nothing about firearms. Thought maybe I could scare him. Who'd you want to scare now? Who were they? Well, they said they was renting a store next to mine. Said they was jewelers. Could open up a valley branch for lasting wells. You know, the big jewelry store downtown here? Uh-huh. Crooks. That's what they were. Out and out crooks. Went looking for them early this morning. Back door to their store was open, you know, the one next to mine. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I couldn't find hide the hair of them. The place was empty. Just a couple of fakes. Had the windows soaked over so nobody could see what they were up to. Pound on some old boards, making me think that they was remodeling. Uh-huh. How much money did they get from you? Not them exactly. A fellow working with them. Must have been working with them. Only way it makes sense. Well, now, suppose you tell us about it, will you? And he'd come into my shop the day before yesterday, oh, it was long about one o'clock in the afternoon, called himself Norman Christ. He said he was from Greeley. Really? He, that's a town in Colorado where I my see. brother lives. Mm-hmm. Said he, he knew my brother Ed back there. What did he want with you? Well, he claimed that Ed asked him to look me up, see how I was doing. Probably didn't know Ed at all. They must have told him, them Jura fellas. Uh-huh. I got to thinking back. Remembered I mentioned having a brother in Colorado one day when we was having lunch. Told him the town, too, really. Uh, what happened then? Did he sell you the ring? Oh, you know about that, too. Well, you tried to pawn it, didn't you? No, sir, not really. I I just wanted to find out how much it was worth so that I could tell Sarah, you know, I was going to surprise her. Figured that I'd give him another day before I tried to sell it. Well, how'd you happen to buy it? Oh... 
I wasn't buying it outright. I was just loaning him on it. Mm-hmm. Told me he had a chance to option some property out near Encino. Real bargain. Said he had to close the deal by 5 p.m. that same day. He needed cash for a clincher. Mm-hmm. Had to get the money from Colorado. That's what he said. He was afraid he wouldn't be here in time. He couldn't go to the bank. Didn't have any credit in L.A. Uh-huh. Needed $3,000. He said that if I'd loan him a three, he'd give me back 4000 first thing the next morning. Offered me his ring for security. He said it was worth 7000 easy. Said it cost him more than that. You hand the money over? <laughs> no, sir. Not by a darn sight. Told him I didn't have $3,000. I told him straight out. Uh-huh. Said all I had was 1500 in my savings account. I guess I shouldn't have said that. Very not, sir. He told me he might be able to swing it for fifteen hundred. Uh, he'd have to go out there and see him in person. Said he'd come back. Did he leave then? Mm, no, not right away. I stopped him. I told him there was no point in coming back. I'm no jewel. I said, how do I know that ring's worth seven thousand dollars? Told me to get it appraised while he was gone. Told me to take it to any jewel I wanted to. Seemed like he sure trusted me. Even a valuable ring like that kind of sold me on him. Mm -hmm. I went next door to ask those fellows who said there was jewelers. Place was locked up, so I figured they was still out for lunch. Mm -hmm. I figured maybe they was in the drugstore down on the corner, see? Uh, Did you find them up there? Yes, sir. What'd they say about the ring? Perfect, Emma. That's what they said. One of them put a gadget up his eye, looked through a... You know what I mean? Yes, sir, I know. Perfect ammo, worth $10,000. Not the wall in it. Mm-hmm. Acted like they thought it was mine. Offered to buy, if I wanted to sell. I told them about the other fellow. That he needed $3,000. I, I told them the whole story. I did. Uh-huh. They said they'd loan him five without batting an eye. Offered to make out a check right then and there. Kind of took my wind away. They were so anxious. I said, maybe we could go in 50-50. They put up 1500 I'd put up 1500 That way, the guy would have 3000 if he still needed that much. They could both make a little profit, you know. Mm-hmm. One of them asked me how I wanted to check. should make it out to me. I told him, oh, make it out to cash. You remember how he signed it? Jones. Quincy Jones. That's the name I knew him by. Other one called himself Wyatt Truesdale. I don't think that's their real name. Do you? Probably one of those, uh, what did you call them? Aliases. Yes, sir, yes, 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 that's it. Well, anyway, I went over to my bank and drew out the 1500 About 2.30, the fellow came back, the one who gave me the ring. Yeah. Said he tried to talk the real estate people into being satisfied with 1500 Wouldn't come down. Insisted on the whole 3000 I told him not to worry that I had it. Give him my 1500 and the check. He said the check would be okay, seeing how it was on a local bank. He promised that he'd uh, pay me back the next morning. That'd be yesterday. Yes, sir. And when he didn't show up, I wanted to make sure just how much it was worth, the ring. Mm-hmm. In case something had happened to it. In case he didn't uh, come back for it. That's why I went to the pawn shop. Mm-hmm. Offered me five dollars for it. The man in the pawn shop. Couldn't believe him at first. Said it was just glass, hunk of glass. Then a great light broke on me. How I'd been tricked. All of a sudden it come to me. Well, why'd you stay out all night? Why didn't you go home? Well, you see, uh, sir, I I couldn't face uh, Sarah. I knew I'd been swindled. Fifteen hundred dollars. Every cent that we'd saved. Been married 37 years. It was Sarah's money, too. Mm -hmm. Not just because she's my wife. To help earn it. Well, we'll try and get it back for you, Mr. Hunt. (sighs) Not much to show for 37 years, is it? That's what I kept thinking while I was sitting in my car up there in the hills. All day long, just kept thinking. 37 years. $1,500. $1,500. I'll... I'll have to tell her, Well, sir, I think that's up to you. 
She'll know it anyway. She'll know something's wrong. Yes, sir. Too late to start all over. We won't have them. There's not a chance. Have what, sir? Another 37 years. We continued to interview the victim, Garfield Hunt, and he gave us descriptions of the three suspects. The stats office came up with 24 possibles. We showed the mug books to Hunt. He identified two of the photographs, Ernest Wilcoxon and Paul Cleaver. Hunt was positive that Wilcoxon and Cleaver were the men who had rented the store next to his and had pretended to be jewelers. He was unable to find a photograph of Norman Chris, the man who had sold him the ring. We pulled the packages on Wilcoxon and Cleaver. They'd both done time for burglary. They had not previously worked with a third person. We called the Lassingwell Jewelry Company. They informed us that they were not opening a branch out in the valley. We checked with the owners of the building in which Hunt had his tailor shop. They told us the adjacent store had been rented on a weekly basis and that the renters had said they intended to use the space for temporary storage. A local and an APB were sent out on all three suspects. 5.13 p.m., using the information from their mama sheets, Frank and I began checking various places where Cleaver and Wilcoxon had been known to hang out. 7.12 p.m., we went into the Black Parrot Bar on South Broadway and we talked to the bartender. Uh-uh. Not by them names, they don't know them. Well, maybe these pictures will help. Hmm. How about it? Yeah, they come in here once in a while. Yeah, that's what we heard. Always come in together? As far as I know. Ever bring somebody with them? Tall, thin fellow, about 30, blonde hair? No, uh, just two of them. Never seen them with another guy. I see. What do you want them for? You know how we can turn them up? We ain't here now. We can wait. Won't be in tonight. How do you know? They got money. Oh? Big roll. The red-headed one was in yesterday. Quincy Jones. That's what he told me his name was. Yeah. Been running a tab. He paid it up in full. I had plenty left over. Yeah, right. As long as they're carrying a roll, they don't come to my place. Head for them expensive joints, like out on the strip, you know, places like that. When they've blown their loot, they come back to me and start running up another tab. I called them on it, but what can you do? This way I get some of their bundles. Uh-huh. You know where they live? Around here somewhere. I couldn't pin it down for you. Who could? How bad do you want to find out? What do you mean? It'll cost you a drink. You that thirsty? Oh, not for me. The girl over there in the corner booth, the blonde. Oh, yeah. She knows them. Been out with him a couple of times. I've seen them leave together. All right. I'm just kidding about that drink. It's on the house for you guys and her, too. No, we don't want anything. And we'll pay for hers. It's up to you. Hi. Good evening, miss. You're new, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. Place could stand some new talent. Here, I'll move over. Thanks. Thank you. What's the matter with this side? We're police officers. How do you like that? Ma'am? Orsco said I was going to meet somebody new today. You know, in the morning paper? Mm-hmm. Didn't say it'd be cops. Oh, here you are, Pike. Where'd that come from? These guys. You shouldn't call them guys, Jake. A fellow buys a lady a drink, that makes him a gentleman. Call me gentleman, that's what you should say. <laughs> oh, sure. To your very good health, gentlemen. <clears throat> now then, what can I do for you? I'm at your service. The bartender says these guys are friends of yours. Well, I wouldn't say those pictures do them justice, but there is a resemblance. You know them, then? We've met. We weren't formally introduced, but we've met. I mean, a lot of people in here. Not the best people in town, maybe. It's not the best bar in town, but it's convenient. I work down the street. Uh-huh. You know where these men live? Huh? Oh, you mean these two so-called friends of mine? Yeah. Am I? Well... Did you ever hear of the North Cross Arms Hotel? Yeah. Well, I haven't been there with them, of course. I'm, I'm not sure that that's their residence, but Quincy was carrying a hotel key, and one night it fell out of his pocket. I think that was the name on the tag, North Cross Arms. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you for the brandy. Don't mention it. Tonight, what do we owe you? Six bits. She drinks good stuff. There you go. Keep the change. Looks like I got one decent break. That's so? Them paying their tab today before you pick them up. No, they didn't pay it. Huh? Who did? Man named Hunt. The clerk at the Norcross Arms Hotel told us that two men who resembled Wilcoxon and Cleaver were registered under the names of Jones and Truesdale. He said they'd gone out for the evening. He showed us up to their room, 36A. We asked him about the suspect known as Norman Crisp. He told us he'd never seen anybody with Wilcoxon and Cleaver who answered Crisp's description. 2.48 a.m., Wilcoxon and Cleaver returned to their room. 
We took him into custody and drove him down to the city hall for questioning. How many times you want to hear Until it? we get the truth. Does Hunt say he gave us any money? He never gave us a cent, did he, Ernie? No, we even paid his lunch tab a couple of times. That's right. Always managed to out-fumble us. Owes us a couple of lunches. He paid him back. What? 1500 bucks buys a lot of lunches. What 1500 You got your share. You've been spending all over town. Hunt say he gave it to us? We still had over 600 bucks when we picked you up. Now, where'd it come from? Hollywood Park. Picked three long shots yesterday. You want the names of the horses? Where's Chris? Told you before, never heard of him. Who is he? The guy you worked the game with. Never heard of him. You want to take this rap yourself? What rap? Why'd you rent that store out in the valley? Store? We showed him your mug shots, the man you rented it from. He made you. You want it in person? How about it? I guess they got us there, Ernie. Yeah. We were going to open up a bookie joint. Is that right? Yeah, we changed our minds, looked the situation over, decided it might get a little warm out in the valley and cleared out. Bookie joint, huh? That's right. Not a jewelry store. What are you talking about? Us? Jewelers? Ernie and me? That's what you told Hunt. Nothing of the kind. Laid it on the line. Told him we were bookies. Just between us, he was kind of pleased about it. Likes to play the horses himself. Like the idea of being able to lay a bet so convenient. You're a liar. Now, look. Say, maybe that's what happened to his money. Maybe he lost it on a nag. Come on, let's try it again. Now, why'd you rent the store? You're going to get the same answers. Same questions, same answers. It's a waste of time. We got plenty. Uh Uh-uh. 72 hours. That's all you got. You can hold us on suspicion for 72, then you can turn us loose unless you prove something. We'll prove it. How? We didn't take any money from Hunt. Nobody says we did, even him. If he was a mark for this, what's his name, Chris? That's right. How do you wrap us into the package? Hunt never saw us with him. Nobody saw us with him. We'll find somebody. 72 hours, and you got to turn us loose. That's the law. Is that right? We know the law. Why'd you break it? We continued to question the suspects, but we were unable to break them down. Thursday, May 19th, 7.45 a.m. Another team of detectives took over the interrogation. Frank and I went back to the office. You think they'll cop out, Joe? I don't know. It doesn't look like it, does it? No. Not unless we turn up to Chris. Did you call your wife? Yeah. Sure balled me out. Kept dinner waiting till after 10. You're lucky. Well, maybe. wonder if I'll get home tonight. I got it. Bunko Fugitive, Friday. Yeah, that's right. Sounds like him. How long ago? Uh-huh. Yeah. Chris? Fits the description. Smashed up a car on the Hollywood freeway. Georgia Street recognized him from our teletype. He able to talk? Died ten minutes after they brought him in. At the morgue, the victim, Garfield Hunt, identified the body. He was positive it was Norman Chris, the man who had sold him the ring. Will Coxon and Cleaver were also shown the body. They denied it they'd ever seen Chris before. The next day, Friday, May 20th, the evidence against Will Coxon and Cleaver was taken to the district attorney's office. The complaint was refused. The evidence was deemed insufficient to bring the matter to trial at this time. Will Coxon and Cleaver were released. 6.05 p.m. Frank and I got ready to sign out. Well, that really tears it. Sure does. The DA's office knows they're guilty. We know it and can't do a thing. Yep. I guess we've been wasting our time, Joe, just fanning the ball. Well, I'll tell you, we've spotted them, and they're going to stay spotted. Yeah. Next time they move in on a mark, we'll make it stick. It wouldn't be very smart of them to try it twice. They're not smart. Huh? They tried it once. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. Two months later, on July 12th, Will Coxon and Cleaver were apprehended for a similar crime. They were charged with one count grand theft. On November 6th, the trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court, State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. <laughs> Ernest T. Will Coxon and Paul Cleaver were found guilty of one count grand theft and were sentenced to a term prescribed by law. Grand theft is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail for a period of not less than one year or for a period of from one to ten years in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action, and starring Jack Webb, a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. <laughs> <laughs> 